Are you ready? Now, I'm not asking you to stand. If you stand, I'm not going to hit you or anything, but here we go. Psalms 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord. I think that's pretty good advice. Some people trust in a lot of other stuff. You trust in the almighty dollar, especially the Canadian dollar. Good luck. <laughs> you trust in that filthy lucre. You might be disappointed after a while. Some people trust in the government. Good luck. Some people trust in horses and chariots. <laughs> Amen. I don't know what you trust in. I hope you don't trust in the media. <laughs> Hallelujah. The word here says trust in the Lord. It says trust in the Lord and do good. It doesn't say do bad. It says do good. So you trust in the Lord and do good. What's going to happen? He said, you're going to dwell in the land. That means the Lord's going to take care of you. Has the Lord taken care of you? Yes. Hallelujah. God has been good to me. And then he says, you're going to dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. That's what happens when you trust in the Lord. Verily thou shalt be fed. Some of you look like you're doing a good job. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, in my life, I don't ever remember going to bed hungry unless I chose to. The Lord has fed me. He's our provider. Hallelujah. He's the one that shows up in the middle of a dilemma. We've been in places where we didn't really know where our next meal was coming from, and we could tell you those stories, but it came because we trusted in the Lord. We didn't trust in the system. We trusted in the Lord. Hallelujah. And then he says in verse 4, delight thyself also in the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, notify your face. You are delighted. Huh. Hallelujah, when you're delighted, you smile. Praise God, you got the joy of the Lord. And when you delight yourself in the Lord, he said, he, what's gonna happen when you do that? He said, he's gonna give you the desires of your heart. And then he says in verse five, commit. Everybody say, commit. Commit thy way to the Lord. Here's that word trust again, also in him. What's going to happen when you do that? He's going to bring it to pass. His promises are yea and amen. Hallelujah. Heaven and earth are going to pass away, but his word's never going to pass away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Hallelujah. You can go to the bank on this book. If you commit your way unto the Lord, he said, he's going to bring it to pass. Every promise in this book is mine. Hallelujah. Why don't we clap our hands in praise to this God? who never makes a mistake. He's never too early. He's never too late. He's always on schedule. That's my God. I love this chapter. You can go home and read it. It's got so many beautiful nuggets there. The meek shall inherit the earth. Jesus quoted it on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, pastor quoted it this morning in that fantastic, unbelievable message. And I'm tagging into it tonight. Praise God. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Hallelujah, that's in this chapter. And then it leads up to verse 25. You know what? A few years back, I probably could have preached on this scripture simply because it's the word of God, but I couldn't have preached it from experience. But I can preach it from experience now because it says, David said, I have been young or once I was young. Hallelujah. Some people look at me and think I never was young. But trust me, pal, I was young one time. Hallelujah. When I was young, wow, I was, and I had energy and all that stuff. I think I was born that way. 
praise God, I'm going to let you in on a few things that happened in my life to try to, to try to slow me down. Amen. But wow, I, you know what? I was, I was a fast runner. Brother, I could outrun them. I was good, man. We lived in Montreal for a while when I was a kid, and we used to play football between the English kids and the French kids. And I had a friend, his name was Ken Belbin. I said, Kenny, you just put the ball up in the air and I'll get under it. Hallelujah, most of the time I did, brother. He'd throw that thing up there and I was running, looking backwards. And brother, I'd catch that ball and I was gone, Bobby, I was gone. And those French kids running after me saying strange things I didn't understand. <laughs> Hallelujah, but I was gone, man. Wow, I could outrun them, Doc. I could, man. I, I was fast. You know, my first name's Gordon. You know, my, you know what my nickname was? Flash. That's right. They called me Flash. Hallelujah. Flash Gordon. There goes Flash. Wow, those were the fun days, man. Sometimes I'm laying in my bed and I'm daydreaming about that. And I'm getting so worked up in myself. I says to myself, I think I can still do that. I can still do that. I can still do that. But if I tried, I'd fall on my beak and I'd make a fool out of myself. I can't do that no more. I, I'm getting old now. I, I get aches and pains in places I never knew I had places. I, I've been through so many deals, man. I, it's unbelievable. And, yeah, and, and you know, one thing happens to me when I stand to, you know, apostolic church, we stand, stand, stand. I'm not against it. I like it. Praise God. But when you, st I stand for a long time, I got this thing in my back and there's kind of a nerve. I guess it's sciatic or something. It goes right down the right side of my leg here and it gets paralyzed when I stand too long. I can hit it like this and it's just numb. It's a little numb right now. <laughs> My God, man. <laughs> but when I stand a long time, I, I feel it. Then I start shaking a little bit like this. And then I start leaning. <laughs> Think I'm going. <laughs> but I can't sit down because if I sit down, they're going to think I'm backslid. <laughs> I'm not backslid. I just got a bum light. <laughs> Hallelujah. I tell some people... I can worship God a whole lot better sitting down than something you can do standing up. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, I haven't lost my zeal for Jesus just because I'm old. I haven't lost my praise, Pastor Woodward. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's done so much for me. I cannot tell it all. I praise my dear Savior. There's nobody like Jesus. Can I get some old folks here praising God? <laughs> Hallelujah. Do we got any flashes here? Praise God. And then I, when you get old, stuff starts falling out. You know, I used to have thick black hair. Those were the days. My God, I, I wonder now why my wife, she's always bugging me to go to the barber shop. I don't know why, man. You need a haircut. I said, I don't got no hair. When one little deal is sticking up, man, I got to go to the barber shop. My hair is coming out. All kinds of stuff come out. Like, you know, my teeth, they're like stars. They come out at me, you know. I put them in a jar, put them there beside my bed. And the next morning, they're smiling up at me. We're still here. <laughs> Once I was young, <laughs> but now I'm old. I can preach my testimony. Hallelujah. You know, it's hard for me to understand this or, or really put it all together because it seems like just yesterday that Brother A.T. Morgan, some of you never heard of him. That's how old I am. 
A.T. Morgan put his hands on my head and ordained me into the ministry. That was in 1967. I got licensed in 64 and they ordained me, you know, three years later. Boy, there's taking a big chance, my Lord. Then old Howard Goss, first general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church back in the 40s. Amen. He, he superannuated there in Picton and he'd come and he'd put his hands on my little head when I was a boy and he'd pray for me. Lord, use this boy. It was like yesterday. I, I used to sit in, I used to sit in the old elder's house and, and listen to him. And boy, he'd pray for me. He was a spiritual man. Praise God. And I, you know, I've got more time now to look back where I came from and see how good God has been to me. And I look back and I, I know God's got a divine purpose for every life. None of us are checking out till God says we're checking out, so please don't worry about it. Praise God. Yeah, I, I was born in family. My dad had some big problems. We won't go into all that. And then I, my young years, my dad became very abusive and beat me and beat me and beat me until my self-esteem was just about gone. I, I was a, you know, and that puts fear in you and you're afraid of everybody and everything. And as a little boy in the middle of all that, God had called me to preach. And I remember the first time I got up to preach, I, I, I preached for about two minutes and then I turned the service back to the leader because, because I was just, I had stage fright. Amen. I, I come a long way. I, I don't think I have stage fright tonight. I, I'm a little better than I was. So I, I was beaten to the point where sometimes my dad would beat me so, so hard until blood would literally come down my back. Yeah, that was really something. And then the devil, I guess he must have known that God had a real plan for my life. Pastor was preaching about it this morning. Hallelujah. When I was five years old, I almost bled to death on an operating table. There in Picton, Ontario, it was a simple tonsillectomy. And something, the doctor cut something, I guess he shouldn't have, and I, I was hemorrhaging, and, I, and they were trying to save my life, and they never did get the tonsils out. They got them out a few years later when I was nine. And then when I was 13, I got kicked in the stomach very hard and my appendix burst and had to rush me to the hospital and poison was running all through my body. They thought me, they were going to lose me then. Huh. All kinds of stuff. Married my wife. I was 128 pounds. I was just a little bitty guy. I was just getting over a nervous breakdown that I had when I was 14 because of the beatings of my father. When I was in Montreal, between the ages of 14 and 16, I'd go and I, I had to leave high school because they wouldn't let me stay there because I, my nerves were so shot I couldn't sit in the seat. Principal called my parents in and said, there's something wrong with this kid. He's disrupting the class. He can't stay here. And so now here I am sitting on the curb down there on St. Catherine Street watching the world go by. Wow, afraid to go home because my daddy might beat me again. I felt like I kind of got rehabilitated a little bit. And 17 years old, I left home with $20 in my pocket, not knowing whithersoever I was going. I just had to leave home. But you see, back when I was nine, I, in Picton, I, I got the, the Holy Ghost. I got baptized in Jesus' name. And I'll never forget that day God called me to preach. I, it, was, it was unbelievable, man. Hallelujah. I ran up to my bedroom. I felt the presence of the Lord. And I lay across the bed for a long time. And 
and I knew God was calling me into the ministry, but I had to go through all of that stuff. My daddy beating ministry out of me. My daddy telling me, nobody's going to listen to you, kid, because you're an idiot. You're stupid. That's what you are. Wow, so now 17 years old, I'm leaving home. I had a feeling of exhilaration because I wasn't going to be home anymore and face all of that trauma. Hallelujah, I'm trusting in the Lord. Hallelujah, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to delight in the Lord. I'm going to commit my way to the Lord. I don't understand why my daddy's the way he is, but I got a genuine experience with my God. Hallelujah, my siblings, there's three of them. They all had problems afterwards because old daddy was a hypocrite because he was a man of the cloth. And so if he's a hypocrite, everybody's a hypocrite and, and they want to kill him and all this kind of stuff. But then there was me and God put something into my life when I was a kid. Hallelujah. I might not have had very much self-esteem, but that made me have much more confidence in him. I had to rely on him. I had to depend on him. I had to trust in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's nobody like this God. I haven't come to ask anybody for any kind of sympathy because I'm here to tell you, my God has been good to me. Hallelujah. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. The Lord says, I'm going to take care of old flesh. He's going to be one of my chosen ones. Then he leads me out to Portland, Oregon, the other side of the world, man. To me, I get on a train in Montreal four days and three nights Canadian National Railway. <laughs> Coach Glass. I can still hear the, the clicks. I get to Vancouver. I get on a bus. I ride to Portland. I go to Brother and Sister Johnny Clemens' house because Sister Clemens used to be Ruby Keys, was in my house when I was a nine year old kid. And that's when I got the Holy Ghost. That's when I was baptized in Jesus' name. That's when I was called to preach. We called her Aunt Ruby. That was before she got married. Hallelujah. But now she's married now. And I went through a bunch of stuff, so she recontacts me. She said, Johnny, that's her husband, wants you to preach him a revival. I said, a revival, my debut, man. I show up Sunday morning. I had one suit of clothes. It was threadbare in the back. So I had to be careful leaning over, praying for people. I walked up there, a little $2 Bible with no concordance. I sat down on the platform, look around. Oh, wow, there's the organ player. She's pretty. I said, can't go there now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Her name was Afton. Afton called her. I married that girl. You know, I'm very happy to report to you in my first revival, I ran off of the organ player. Hallelujah. <laughs> well, I didn't just run off with her. I, it took about a year. <laughs> took about a year to develop, but I married that girl. And that's a sweet girl. She was born in Idaho until she was raised there on a farm until she was 16. Then they moved to Portland. And here I am. And we're meeting. Hallelujah. So beautiful. Wow. The Lord knew what I needed when he gave me that woman. I say between Jesus and my dear sweet Afton, I think the Lord made something beautiful out of my life. Because you see, she came from a totally different background than mine. They had a stable home. They were just good people in the church. They never missed church. They had 150 head of dairy cattle. Milk them every morning and every night. They never missed church. 15 miles from the church house. Amen. Her dad was, he was a hard working man and he'd get his family in there and he'd get in the pew and he'd promptly go to sleep. Hallelujah, but he had his family there. Amen, the pastor used to sometimes ask him to stand and give the benediction. Well, this time he threw him a curve and 
he asked him to stand and pray for the offering. Well, he was already asleep. Amen. So his wife nudged him and said, you're supposed to pray. He stood up and dismissed church. <laughs> Hallelujah. But they had him in church. Her parents never raised their voices to each other. They always had love and peace in the home. See, I didn't know nothing about that. Praise God. And so now here we are just, he got married in 1965. And in 1968, we're appointed to be missionaries to the Philippines, youngest missionaries ever appointed up to that time. Wow, I'm just getting over a nervous breakdown. I got a daddy that beats me. I got a daddy don't believe in me. I, I'm stupid, I'm dumb, nobody's ever gonna listen to me. We got two little boys by that time. We arrive in the Philippines and hallelujah, everything's so different and changed and are you, we don't understand a bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in that, but. Here we are. You got to understand, my God, all he wants is somebody that'll say, Lord, just use me. Just use me, Lord. I, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to delight in you, and I'm going to commit my way to you. Hallelujah. And I'm not going to cry in my milk because of all what I've been through. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're my daddy, and I know you're going to lead me. You're going to guide me. Praise God. God, you got a plan for my life. Praise God, if God can use an Allen Oggs, he ought to be able to use a Gordy, huh? Praise God. You know, my name is Gordon George Mallory. You know, I, I never used to be interested in names till my wife got expecting with Jeff and I'd go to the little drugstore, you know, and they had a little deal with a little, they had a little booklet there, suggested names for babies. And so I said, man, I always wonder what my name meant. So I looked out, I said, I know Gordon. Probably means like something like son of the morning or uh, Prince Charming or Old Valiant One or something like that. I looked it up. You know what Gordon means? Gordon means on a cornered hill. Yeah, it didn't do much for me either. <laughs> on a cornered hill. You know, I don't even know what a cornered hill is. But that's what it means. I said, man, I got, I'm so disappointed. I said, I got to look up my middle name. My middle name's George. You know, there's king's name, George. King George V, King George VI. It'll probably have a royal ring to it. I looked up George, and it means farmer. I don't got nothing against the farmers, but that wasn't exotic enough for me. And then I looked up my last name, Mallory, not expecting to find it in that book, and I found it in there as a suggested first name for a girl. <clears throat> I said, there's something wrong with this. And then when I looked up the meaning, you know, Mallory means luckless or unfortunate. So the full meaning of my name, I'm an unlucky farmer living on a corner hill. <laughs> Aren't you glad when you pray, you're not praying in the name of some unlucky farmer on a cornered hill? Aren't you glad when you pray, you're praying in the name of Jesus? Hallelujah. There's power in that name. There's healing in that name. Prayers are answered. Hey, do I have any takers here? Has anybody discovered the power that there is in the name of Jesus? Wherefore, God also have highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. My God, I feel like flash now. It's coming on me. I'm here to tell you, all he's looking for is a willing vessel. Hallelujah. So then I get to the Philippines. Six weeks after I'm there, somebody tries to kill me with a 45 caliber pistol. Thank God it didn't happen. Thank God he was killed himself. Shouldn't maybe say thank God, but. <laughs> Hallelujah. And somebody came to my house with a knife, tried to kill me. Praise God. The old devil just tried to take us out right and left. Amen. And then we were there and it seemed like we were having not very, not a very successful time getting people in the church. Sister Mary and I arrived in Manila. We didn't know anybody. No convert, no contact, nobody. And here we are, young in our early 20s, two little kids, Recovering from a nervous breakdown? <laughs> Hallelujah. 
I used to try to think, man, we gotta, we got to win the rich people because we need resources. <laughs> Didn't win no rich people. And then somebody, one time, the guy that came to my house to kill me with a knife got the Holy Ghost in our house. That's pretty cool. And he went out and became a great soul winner. And do you know where he went? He went to Smoky Mountain, which is, which is notorious. It's a, it's a dump where they have tens of thousands of people living on the dump. Amen. And they just, they're scavengers. When the trucks dump their stuff, they're, they're like ants. And they fight with each other to try to get something of value. They live in these little lean-tos. They have little bitty roads. You can actually drive your car right up on the top of Smoky Mountain. And that guy that came to try to kill me, who had been a member of the New People's Army, which is a communist group, he'd killed several. He was the leader of his group. Amen. He's the one now going to Smoky Mountain, getting these people. And they're coming to the little church that we had rented, which was a former nightclub on the seedy side of town. And here they come. Wow, there was no ventilation in that room. It was really tough. Those people come in there, and I'm like, like ooh couldn't hardly breathe praise God so they were coming they started getting the Holy Ghost getting baptized in Jesus name hallelujah and then I started going to the dump <laughs> hallelujah I got that little she's for Christ van hallelujah we start going to the dump and picking up people for church hallelujah oh wonderful songs we're singing to the dump to the dump to the dump 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 to the dump to the dump hallelujah I'm here to tell you, God don't care where you come from or how low you are. Hallelujah. My Jesus died for all. Hallelujah. And so then I'd go start having Bible studies in the dump. I sit in these little lean-tos and I could describe some of it to you, but you wouldn't believe it. And there I was sitting in the squalor with these people. Hallelujah. Giving them the good news. I think I felt good there because I knew where I came from and my daddy didn't have no confidence in me and stuff. Maybe the people in the garbage heap will listen to me. Hallelujah. My God, man, they had mosquitoes that looked like the size of birds flying through that place. And they were all singing, thank God for the blood. Hallelujah. And one of those suckers drilled me, man. Wasn't long I got what they call H fever. H is in the front of a long word that you can't pronounce. It's kind of like a first cousin of malaria. My wife will tell you, I laid on my bed with a high fever for six weeks, in and out of delirium, not knowing I was going to live or die. Hallelujah. But God has been good to me trust in the Lord delight in the Lord commit your way to him hallelujah he said he's going to take care of you he's going to feed you hallelujah he's going to give you a roof over your head hallelujah that's my God so that was the beginning of the church in Manila never forget the first Real live miracle I saw a lady with a large goiter, four times bigger than any goiter you ever saw. In 30 seconds, I saw that goiter disappear. Hallelujah. I said, my God. Hallelujah. It was a line. We saw, we had a little meeting there. It was one of the first meetings of that kind that we had about, what is it, 1972 or something like that. Amen. And she came through and she was healed. And then four people behind her was a man with a white cane. Hallelujah. He came through the line and afterwards I saw him out there with a cane on the floor beside him and he was looking up and he was blinking, blinking, blinking and he was clapping, he was chuckling. <laughs> Hallelujah. That man had, had whites where there should be pupils. You know, it's really something when you, can, when you can see a man that has nothing but whites and no pupils in his eyes. It's kind of real neat to see the Lord form pupils in his eyes. And for him to go out with 20-20 vision, he was born blind. Hallelujah. He couldn't distinguish light from darkness. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But God healed him. Because God is a good God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Does anybody here believe what we're saying? I'm just here bragging on Jesus.
Once I was young, now I'm old, but never. Somebody say never. I want some of you older folks to say never. Hallelujah, never. Never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. Hallelujah. That's my God. He's my Jehovah Jireh. There's nobody like him. Would somebody just give a little shout of praise? Hallelujah. My God has been good to me. So just real briefly, because this isn't all what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to get to the real stuff here in a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. Church grew. Brother Tenney and Brother Becton were our first visitors, came through. Brother Tenney gave that famous prophetic word back in the early 20s, excuse me, in the early 70s. Amen. A little group of people from the garbage dump, about 35. And I, he said over that pulpit, Amen. I see shooting flames of fire going out from this pulpit. I see these flames of fire spreading throughout Manila. I see them spreading throughout the islands. I see them spreading throughout the world. I see God using the Filipino people to help to facilitate revival around the world. Hallelujah. And when he said it, we're just in this humble little setting. Amen. But I'm here to tell you how many years later, amen, it has come to pass. From that little humble little beginning, amen, God using a people, somebody like me to go there, go to the garbage dump, people get cleaned up. Hallelujah. Now we have 250 United Pentecostal churches in the city of Manila and we can't find a building big enough to put them all in when they all get together. The largest crowd I was in in the Manila crusade we had in 2007, it was the 50 year anniversary of the church in the Philippines. Hallelujah, 250,000 people were present in that park, downtown Manila. And we came a long way from our living room. Hallelujah, we come a mighty long way. Not because of the unlucky farmer on the cornered hill, no sir. Hallelujah, I'm just the instrument the Lord said. Uh, if you let me the, be the potter, hallelujah, and you get up on my wheel, I'll fashion you and mold you into the kind of a vessel I want you to be, and I'll use you for, you, for my glory. Hallelujah, and he'll get the glory. Oh, you can't make this stuff up. Praise God. Now, I could tell you a whole lot more about what's going on in the Philippines, but I'm going to shift gears. I watched online a few weeks ago as your pastor gave a report about the Philippine church. I watched it from the beginning to the end. You did a great job, man. You illustrated it, showed all the videos I would have showed tonight. And it was awesome. It was great. Praise God. And he has done great things. But I was getting older. I'm not missionary anymore in the Philippines. I'm still very much connected, but now I'm home and I'm traveling around. I've been everywhere. <laughs> feel like Willie Nelson. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere. I've been in all 50 states. Been all over Canada. Five continents. Been there, done that. So now here I was getting to be a, right about 60. 59, 60 years old and a little group of people in Maui, Hawaii, lost their pastor. They were mostly Filipinos and they asked us to come to help them to find a new pastor. So we committed ourselves to six weeks. So me and mama arrived there with three suitcases and stayed six years. You know, somebody says, how do you get close enough to God to get called a Maui? <laughs> Praise God. It's a beautiful place, God blessed and all that, but something happened there. I, I mean, I've been through so many deals and the devil tried to kill me how many times, but he ain't going to do it until God gives him the, until God says it's time for me to take him up like pastor preached today. So here I am, I'm preaching on Easter Sunday. First Easter Sunday, I was in Maui. If you can't preach on Easter Sunday, you might as well quit the ministry. I mean, Easter Sunday, man, you ever more got the material, man. 
Hallelujah. Jesus is alive. The resurrection. The Holy Ghost. Praise God. I mean, you can really preach on Easter Sunday. And I preached, man. I preached like I normally always preach. Praise God. Giving it everything I got. And people did get the Holy Ghost. And there was uh, several miracles that took place. And we came back to our little apartment, my wife and I, and we're so happy. Hallelujah. Then we went to bed, went to sleep. About four o'clock the next morning, Amen. I was awakened with a pain in my abdomen. I mean, it was very, very severe. And uh, I never had a pain like that. And uh, I got up and I started to pace the floor. And I, and I just, uh, I, started to lose, I started to lose strength. I felt strength ebbing from my body. I sat on my easy chair and my wife came out and she said, Honey, what's wrong? I said, I said, honey, I don't know what's wrong, but I got this pain in my abdomen. I said, it's severe, it's serious. And, and, and she tried to give me some Alka-Seltzer, and boy, I'm sure that wasn't going to touch it until finally we monitored her for about three hours. Amen. And, uh, and uh, finally it got to the place where I couldn't even walk. I mean, I, I mean my legs wouldn't even support me anymore. It's just come to the... And, uh, and I just... And so finally my wife... She helped me to, we'll go to the clinic. We prayed and we did all that we do as apostolics. And God had touched me many times before. But oh, I'm sick, man. And so I, she gets me down into the car and she takes me to the clinic and they drew blood. They did a stat. And I'm here in this little examining room and I, I'm so sick. I'm almost out of it. I just like, and finally the doctor comes in. He looks at the computer. He's got the results. And I heard him say these words. He kind of said it to himself. Amen. But I overheard him. He said, something catastrophic's going on here. I know that word, catastrophic. This is it. I lived a good life. God's good. God has been good to me. Hallelujah. They take me down, get me cat skin. They find a seven-inch abscess attached to my pancreas. My whole pancreas is inflamed. My body, my whole body is full of E. coli. And there's another infection working in tandem with it. I mean, we're on our, home from, on our way home from the MRI, and the doctor calls my wife. Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. I'll get him ready. I'll get him to the airport. Yes, sir. He told my wife, he said, your husband is very serious. We don't have any way of treating him here in Maui. He's got to go to Honolulu. And so here it all happened so fast. I'm preaching on the resurrection. God's been good to me. I've seen miracles. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen it all happen. And now I'm on my way to, to the Honolulu Hospital. Amen. My wife's wheeling me in at 10.30 at night. It's happened so fast, man. She's wheeling me in and the, the hallway is eerie and quiet. And I just blurt out to nobody in particular, I come to cheer this place up. <laughs> I, think I, I think I'm trying to cheer my own self up. My wife wheels me into a semi-private room. There's two, two beds in there and there's a curtain around one of them. And I don't know what that poor soul's problem was, but he was making some loud, horrible sounds. I mean, he was going, <laughs> He said, my God, get me out of here. I, I'm dying and he is too. I mean, this is bad news. I, I can't stay here. I, 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 I told the nurse, I said, nurse, I need a private room. She said, I'm sorry, sir. You can't have a private room. This is where you're assigned. We don't have no private room and all. I said, no. And I'm like, oh my God. And then she said, your wife can't stay with you. It's the rule of this hospital that not even relatives can't stay with the patients overnight. I said, where's she gonna go? My Lord, she, she lives in Maui, another island over. Is she gonna stay under a bridge? What's gonna happen? And all everything's falling apart. I'm preaching to you about trusting in the Lord, delighting in the Lord. You said it, Pastor, it was so beautiful. <laughs> no matter what the circumstance it don't matter what it is, whether you understand it or don't understand it. God's still God. He's still Lord. He's still my Father. He's promised never to leave me nor forsake me. He's going to be with me even unto the end of the age. The word doesn't change in the middle of your circumstance. Hallelujah. But here I am and I'm like, wow. I said, nurse, I said, can I talk to your supervisor? 
And she said, yes. And do you know what? The supervisor come in and guess what? She's a Filipina. I said, oh, magandang gabi, ma. Good evening. Her eyes already are like this because I said one little phrase in Tagalog, her native tongue. Magandang gabi, ma'am. And she, she's looking like this. I said, oh, come on, ka, ma'am. How are you, ma'am? I said, I said, oh, Sanka Galinsa, Filipinas. Where do you come from in the Philippines? And she, she said, how do you know my language? I said, Filipino, I call. I'm a Filipino. She said, I don't think so. <laughs> so I get to explain to her, you know, we're, we were missionaries in the Philippines. We raised our, our children there. My youngest son was born there. And, and uh, Filipino people are so beautiful. They're so wonderful. They're so awesome. There's nobody like Filipinos. Hallelujah, I'm a little, you know, I'm a little prejudiced, I guess. Hallelujah, nobody, they're God-conscious people. Hallelujah, they're wonderful people. Amen, and so I told her a little bit about stuff and told her a few miracles, and then I, while I'm talking to her, I noticed a tear come out of her eye. She said, sir, I want to thank you for your sacrifice. I said, oh, Bob, no sacrifice. I said, the greatest days of our lives were spent in your beautiful country. We love your people. She said, I want to thank you for what you've done for my people. And she was overcome with emotion. And then she said, sir, what do you need? I said, well, I need a private room. <laughs> I don't think I said it like that, but... <laughs> I said, we, I'd like to have a private room and I, I'd like my wife to be able to stay with me because we're in the, remote, the most remote land mass on earth is Hawaii. It's out in the middle of the ocean. You know, we came from, I'm a people guard, man. There's always people around us. We just came out of the greatest revival and we, we know everybody. We got friends all over. the. And it's just me and mama now out in this remote place. Well, she says, Sunday Lila. That means for a while, just a moment. She left, she came back about 15 minutes later and she got up on my ear. She says, I found you a private room. I said, yes, <laughs> I'm dying, but I got a private room to do it in, hallelujah. <laughs> and she said, if nobody says anything, we're gonna pull a little bed in there and your wife can stay with you. Wow, then Dr. Takamori comes in the next morning. Do you want me to shoot straight with you, he said. I said, yes. He said, people that have what you have at the level you have it usually never leave a hospital. You're terminal. He said, the infection is so pervasive, it's almost impossible to get rid of it. They put me on the strongest antibiotics you can put in the human body for three solid months. They stuck me full of stuff, that, like tubes, to try to drain it. He said, if none of that works, he said... The last resort is we'll have to do a surgery. We'll cut you from here to here, all across your abdomen. And the surgeons put their hands inside your abdomen and literally scoop the infection out with their hands. I said, wow, I hope it doesn't come to that. He said, yeah. But eventually that's what had to happen because nothing worked. I lost 60 pounds in the first two months I was wasting away. And here's what I want to tell you. When I was laying on my bed, it was the first Sunday. The first Sunday I was in that hospital. And I was laying on my bed and sis was there sitting beside me. <coughs> and I was reminiscing. I was crying. <coughs> Not because I was sad or I was afraid. <coughs> but I was, I had a chance to look back over my life. <coughs> and see how good God had been to me. Where God brought me from it was amazing. Give me three wonderful boys, and grandchildren. He let me start a brand new generation. Sure wasn't going to walk in my daddy's footsteps, <clears throat> but I was going to take the hand of my heavenly Father firmly, and He was going to lead me. So I was there, and I was, I was thanking God, and I was saying, Lord, if this is my time to go. <clears throat> I guess I can go happy because you put me on the front row of one of the greatest apostolic revivals that has ever happened. Hallelujah. 
So while I'm laying there, <clears throat> amen, I heard music right outside my door. And then I heard singing. It sounded like angels, man. <laughs> I thought for a minute I was hallucinating. <clears throat> they come to get me, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. But then I looked over at my wife and said, honey, do you hear what I'm hearing? And she said, yes. And right outside my door, in that hospital in Honolulu, they're singing, Majesty. Worship His Majesty. <laughs> Hallelujah. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise the oh, oh, majesty. Hallelujah. Kingdom authority. Does anybody feel Jesus? <laughs> Jesus who died, but he's now glorified. And he's a king of all kings. Come on, everybody, majesty. Oh, yes. Oh, worship his majesty. Hallelujah. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Oh, oh, majesty. Oh, Jesus is in the house. Yes, he is. Kingdom authority. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus who died, but he's now glorified and he's the king of all kings. Somebody praise him. Somebody worship him. He's my Jesus. He's my majesty. There's nobody like him. He's my Lord. He's my God. He's everything to me. Hallelujah. Something stirring in the house. Hallelujah. Because we're trusting. We're delighting. We're committing. Hallelujah. That's my God. Hallelujah. I call the nurse, nurse, nurse. The nurse comes in. I said, what's going on outside my door? She called them a little Christian group. She said, they've been coming here for 25 years. She said, they were singing the hallways to encourage the patients. We don't let them in the patient's rooms unless the patient invites them in. I said, they come in. They got ukuleles, guitars, tambourines and Joe's my Lord and they're all smiling they gather around my bed I believe God sent them to me hallelujah they start calling me pastor because I told them where I was from the whole deal and they say pastor is there anything else we can sing for you today and we'd sing and we'd worship and I'd weep before the Lord it was so beautiful it was so wonderful I got looking forward to their visits. They come every Sunday and they come in and we sing and we'd worship. It was so beautiful. And then one day Takamori comes in and he said, sir, we tried everything and we're going to have to do that surgery. Frankly, we don't know if you're going to pull through. You're going to have to sign special papers because it's, it's, it's a life or death situation. He said, we've arranged for 8.30 Monday morning. He said, we don't know if you're going to make it. Hallelujah. It's okay. So Sunday, just before my surgery, Monday, here comes my little group. <clears throat> they come in and they're smiling. Pastor, what do you want us to say today? I said, well, my 
surgery is tomorrow. And the doctor doesn't know if I'm going to make it. I don't know if I'm going to see you guys again or not. So why don't we just sing that song? Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. <laughs> Hallelujah! Because he lives, all fear, my God, it's gone. And because I know, oh yes, I know, he holds the future. And life, sing it now, is worth the living just because I know he lives. Come on, everybody. Let's make a mighty choir. Ha -ha. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Something's happening in the house. Because he lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All fear, all fear is gone. Hallelujah, because I know, oh yes, I know. Ha ha, he holds the future. Hallelujah, and life. Come on now. It's worth the living just because I know he lives. I need somebody to praise the Lord right now. I need somebody to praise the Lord. I need somebody to worship him tonight. I need somebody to praise him. I need somebody to love him. I need somebody to fall in love with him all over again. Come on. It's our time to trust. Hallelujah. It's our time to delight. It's our time to commit. There's nobody like my Jesus. The Lord God has been good to me. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. 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 There's a healer in the house right now. There's a healer. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Hallelujah. Come on, let's receive it. Let's receive it into our spirits. We come a mighty long way, Lord, trusting in you, leaning on you. Nobody like him. Nobody. Hallelujah. 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 Now, I know I've been taking some time I don't know when I'm going to get another crack at you. So if you'll give me just another few minutes, what I'm about to tell you is absolutely incredible. Unbelievable. When you trust the Lord, beautiful things happen. Amen. So here I am. I'm having a good time. I'm just... My family all came to visit me in Maui. I wasn't there. I was in Honolulu dying. I told the doctor, I said, I got to go see my family. He said, you can't walk. I said, well, my wife can wheel me in a wheelchair. Amen. I still had tubes hanging out of me. And when my grandkids saw me, my Lord, it scared them to death. I was like death warmed over. I got a picture of it. Amazing. And I said, I want to go see my family. But the doctor said, I'm sorry, 
but I can't let you out because even after the surgery, there's still infection in your body. It won't go away all by itself. I said, well, if I'm going to die anyway, I won't go see my family. He signed papers. He said, be back Monday. I didn't say anything. My wife wheeled me into the, to the airplane, wheeled me into the airport in Maui. Because I, when I, she wheeled me into that airplane, I had a smile on my face. I said, Lord, I'm never going back to this place. They can't do it with antibiotics and tubes and surgery where they cut you. This wasn't laparoscopic, folks. This was all across my belly. Got the scar to prove it. I said, I'm just going to trust God. Hallelujah. Well, over a period of several months, I regained my strength. I kept going to a clinic there in Maui. They kept testing my blood. Finally, one time I got it tested. Nurse came out and she was waving it. I thought she got the Holy Ghost. She said, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal. I said, well, thank God. I got a little more time to preach, man. Praise God. And then, then years go by and, well, several years, not much, but I met because of the times. It's about, what was it now? About eight years ago. I met because of the times, and I'm there, and my wife, and my son Jeff, and his wife. And there was a break in, the, in between sessions, and the Spirit of the Lord was moving. And a man who's a prophet of God, used in the prophetic, Anthony Mangan spoke to him and says, you got a word for Jeff Mallory. And so he came down, and he took me by the, the arm and he put his other hand on Jeff's chest that's my eldest son and he said the mantle of your father is upon you greater things are you going to see than your father has ever seen and he began to enumerate several things that were greater and I'm standing by and I'm thinking well hallelujah we saw a pretty good revival you know I mean we got the largest constituency of any constituency in, a, in the world and we saw 100,000 people get the Holy Ghost in one day. Pastor Woodward was part of that and several others here. <laughs> that was pretty cool. But greater things are you going to see than your father's ever seen. Wow, that was awesome. Amen. So because of the times ending, about five months later, Jeff took our church in Maui. And about five months into it, he called me on the phone. I was on the road. I was going over a mountain somewhere. And he called. He said, Dad. You know, that lump that's been growing on my neck, he said, it's, it's bad, Dad. He said, it's bad. They said, I have mantle cell lymphoma. And he said, they've given me maximum four years to live. He was 42 years old. It's one thing for Daddy to be sick, but I'm already older. It's another thing for your 42-year-old son, amen, to be diagnosed with terminal cancer. Wow. Oh, you don't know how I felt. Then it was like I could deal with my deal a whole lot better than I'd deal with his. I said, Jeff, get to Oregon. Get a second opinion. Surely it's not that way. And he packed up, and him and his wife came to Oregon. They went through all the tests, and they told him there. They said, yeah. He said, there's only six hospitals in all of America that will even attempt any kind of chemo, but it's terminal. You can't live. They just try to kick the can down the road. But they told him the National Institutes of Health are trying to find cures and this and that and the other. So he tried to figure out what to do and all of that. And he, his whole life changed. Amen. He decided, I'm going to go to the National Institutes of Health. Amen. And I'll just give my body to science. Maybe I can help for somebody else to find something as they go along. Research hospital. Amen. But he said, before I go, I... I'm going to, they accepted him there and he said, but before I go, I'm going to go back to Maui for two weeks and I'm going to just be with our people and try to put faith in them. And while he was in Oregon, he was out in his uncle's backyard and he saw a little stone that was different than the other stones and he picked up this stone and, and he clutched it and the Lord spoke to him and said, Jeff, you're just walking through the valley, picking up stones 
so that you can defeat this Goliath that's come to your life. Hallelujah. For the next two and a half years, every day, Jeff had that stone, and he would repeat what the Lord told him. I'm just walking through the valley, picking up stones. Hallelujah. And then I'd be going down the road, and I'd be pounding the steering wheel. Devil, you're a liar. You're a liar. And then it came to me. My God, I never heard of mantle cell lymphoma until my son got it. Amen. But the prophet of God said, the mantle of your father is upon you. And that dirty devil says, I'm going to put an evil mantle on him. I'm going to put a mantle of death on him so that he can never realize the fulfillment of the prophetic word. Devil, you're a liar. You're a liar like you were to Job. Ha ha. You're a liar. There's no truth in you. Hallelujah. If God said it, I believe leave it. That settles it. It's done. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Jeff goes to the hospital, the research hospital. He's the youngest person they ever had, they ever tested that got this disease. And, and there he is. We see him wasting away. Every lymph node in his body is swollen. 70% of his bone marrow is full of cancer. They do, another, they do another surgery unrelated. They take 30 inches of his colon. He does the colostomy. Amen. My wife and I canceled all of our stuff and we went out there to be near him. It was an unbelievable time in our lives. I'd go up into that hospital and I'd see Jeff. Sometimes he's trying to walk in the hallway. He's pushing that deal with all the stuff. And hallelujah. One time I can see him kind of looking at me. He looked like death in his eyes. And he'd smile at me and say, Dad, I'm just walking through the valley picking up stones so that I can defeat, defeat this devil, this Goliath in my life. Hallelujah. It was incredible. You know, when he had that surgery I told you about, amen, I don't know where my wife and I were that night, but it was just him and Brenda in the room, and Brenda got a migraine. Her head felt like it was going to come off of her head, and he's laying there, and he says that he had a reaction to the nuclear medicine, pain medicine they gave him, and he never felt pain like that in his life. It was horrible. And he's dying from this cancer, but he's still trusting the Lord. And he said, he just raised his hands with the cords, wires coming down. He said, God, you've been so good to me. I love you. But Lord, I, I don't think I can take any more of this pain. Lord, would you take away my pain? And when he said that, the door to his hospital room flew open. And an African-American nurse, dressed like a nurse he'd never seen before, walked into the room. She just raised her hands. She said, I've come to dispatch angels into this room. And that's all she said. She turned around and she walked out. And when the door slammed behind her, Jeff said, I felt, I felt something I never felt before. The peace of God came down on me. Said my pain was gone. Hallelujah. And I praised and I magnified him there in that room. So awesome. Hallelujah. Brenda looked over at Jeff. She said, Jeff, my migraine's gone. Hallelujah. It's gone. Oh, the angels of the Lord and camp around and about them that fear him. They're ministering spirits that he sometimes sends. Hallelujah. Does anybody here believe that? Hallelujah. I need some witnesses in this house. I feel the angelic beings in this house right now. I believe the presence of a holy God is in this house. I believe he has come to meet with us tonight. Hallelujah. Brenda's cell phone rang. Five minutes after the angelic being came into the room, it was Melanie Shock from Alexandria. They were having a prayer meeting in their house, and Jeff's kids were there, Jordan and Morgan and Corey. Hallelujah, they were praying. They were praying for their dad. And in the middle of that prayer meeting, Corey, she got a hold of Melanie. She said, Melanie, she said, I just, I just had a vision of an angel 
walking into my dad's room. Yes. I want you to call him and tell him that I believe everything's going to be all right. Hallelujah. And so here the phone rings. Hallelujah. And right after the angelic being come in, amen, now they're confirming it from Alexandria, Louisiana. You know what? You can't make this stuff up, folks. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you, I don't know what you're going through. I don't care what you're going through. I'm here to tell you, my God's with you because you're one of his dear children. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, I I feel like somebody needs to praise him. Somebody needs to worship him. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask everybody to stand right now. You know, if you stand up, it'll, it'll give me more inspiration to bring it to a close. Although I'm really far from finished, but I've gone too long. I just felt Jesus. I feel Jesus. I feel like before we walk out of this auditorium, God's going to do something very special for some people that really desire it. So where's Jeff now? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, he walked through his valley. Amen. The doctors said that we can't really do anything for you. Whenever they would come into his room, there was a team of 10 scientists and doctors. They'd look at him. Early on in his experience, these doctors looked at him and said, Mr. Jeff, you're a very special person. We've never met anybody like you. We've all agreed we've never met a patient like you. He said, we admire you because we've never seen anybody with an attitude like yours. (laughs) old Jeff just looked at him and he said sirs it's not my attitude sometimes my attitude is not very good but he said what you see in me is my faith I have faith in God he said I I want you men to know that I I do thank God for you every day because Dr. Wyndham Wilson, which is the head of his team of doctors, is a number one, recognized as the number one lymphoma specialist on planet Earth. Huh. He said, God has given me the best team of doctors that there is on the planet. And I'm thankful for that. But he looked at them and he said, there's one doctor that trumps all of you. That's really the head of the team. His name is Jesus. He's my great physician. Hallelujah. Oh, Jeff is their trophy boy now because they tell us that according to their records, our son Jeff, apostolic preacher called of God, is the only person they know that is alive today longer than four years with mantle cell lymphoma. Not only has he lived longer than four years, he's lived eight years. And hear about what was it now? Is it two years? Two years ago, he was there. They always test him. He gets tested. He's being tested again next week. He's flying all the way from Manila to D.C. for two days of testing. Then he flies back to the Philippines. Two years ago, they looked at him and they said, you're a rare bird. We did everything we can to find a cancer cell in your body. And the cancer's gone. It's not there anymore. (laughs) Hallelujah. So there they are in the Philippines now. Greater things are you going to see than your father has ever seen. He's met the president of the Philippines three times. He had a one-on-one dinner with him. And the president, amen, he's kind of a 
quite the guy. I don't know what you've heard about Rodrigo Duterte, but amen, he's to put a war on drugs. The year before he became president, 6,000 drug addicts surrendered to the government. In the first year he was president, 1.7 million drug addicts surrendered to the government. It overpowered their ability to be able to rehabilitate. They went to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church turned them down flat. So then they came to the United Pentecostal Church in the Philippines and said, we want you to do whatever you can to rehabilitate 1.7 million drug addicts. And the church there in the Philippines has appointed our son, Jeff, who the devil wanted to be dead to oversee the project. So he's over there doing some unbelievable things for the Lord, just helping the national church, hallelujah, have revival. We're so thankful. Hallelujah. God has been good to me. Hallelujah. God has been good to me. Is it possible to get the singers up here and sing that song you sung just before we got up to preach? Is that, is that a possibility? Praise God. And that was so awesome. And you know what? I'm a nobody. I'm, 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 you know who? I already told you where I came from. You know, I appreciate the, the wonderful introduction, and I, 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 I appreciate it. I accept it. I thank, I thank Pastor for doing that. But I know where I came from. Hallelujah! And so, and and you know, there's there's nothing special in me, but I know my God. I, I've seen some incredible miracles, and if you're here and you need a miracle tonight. It might be body, it might be soul, whatever it is. Please don't miss this moment because if you step out of your place boldly and walk up here while the group's singing, hallelujah, I, I might ask them to stop at a certain point and then I'm going to have a, I'm going to pray a prayer of healing over you and it's happened before so I have every belief it's going to happen again. There will be multiple miracles that will take place in this altar here today. Somebody say multiple. Hallelujah, because that's my God. Hallelujah. He's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask or think. Praise God. So they're going to sing, and when they sing about God being good to us, I want you to think and contemplate about how good, good God has been to you. You need a miracle. I don't care what it is. Might be blood pressure. Might be heart problem, cancer. We just prayed for a lady, amen, with cancer over here just earlier in the service, before the service started. I believe God started a work in her, and if she's in the audience, you can come up again. I believe God will complete the work. But whoever you are and wherever you are, amen, I want you to come while they sing right now. Would you do it? Praise God. Halabaha Sakalabaha. Been so good. Lord, you are good. 